Welcome to Climate Now, the podcast that explores and explains the ideas, technologies, and the solutions that we'll need to address the climate crisis and reach a zero emissions future. I'm James Lawler, and to sign up for our newsletter, which goes out every Tuesday morning with the link to the latest podcast episode, background information, relevant links, go to climatenow.com. To get in touch with us, email us at contact at climatenow.com. We always love to hear from our listeners, so don't be shy. For today's episode, it's the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel economy, at least according to the research of our two guests. The first is Kings Mill Bond of green energy think tank RMI, whose work suggests that the market for fossil fuels for electricity production has now peaked. Next, Nat Bullard, a veteran energy analyst and regular author for Bloomberg Green, will discuss the technologies, industries, and policies that will shape the future of a net zero world. But first, it's time for our news segment, This Week in Climate News. We're going to start this week with difficult news. The World Meteorological Organization released a new report. They have increased the chance that we will exceed 1.5 degrees for an annual average by 2025. And they've basically gone from a 50-50 chance to a two-thirds likelihood that we're going to do that. It's hard to call this news. I mean, we kind of knew that we were all (laughs) heading this way. It's noteworthy, though. Agree with you, Julio, that, you know, we have known that this has been in jeopardy and more unlikely than likely for a little while, it seems. I guess, you know, the thing that headlines like this does that I think concerns places like Rocky Mountain Institute, where I work, and other advocates is is it communicates to some that efforts are lost, right? And and every degree matters, right? At this point. So I worry when I when I see headlines like this about what the impact on people's psyches and mindset is because we need to act and we need to act quickly and we typically don't act from despair we act from hope we need more believers or we need just more investment and uh, if this puts a fire underneath investors and decision makers and policymakers, then the outcome could be positive exactly in that context we are seeing the opportunity to harvest abundant clean energy growing around the developing world. And an excellent example of that is now in Africa. Specifically, a solar startup uh, has gotten $250 million, Mkapa. They have pioneered the pay-as-you-go model. The fact that there's that much investment going into it, and from a group like Standard Bank, again, gives one some optimism that we can, in fact, pull in the right direction and make some progress. Speaking of progress, we've seen some noteworthy progress in mobility and EVs specifically around Ample. Darren, you want to talk about that? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Julio. Well, the news over the last few days is that Ample, which is a battery swapping startup, has unveiled their next generation station. Apparently, this one can cut uh, battery swapping times down to five minutes. Of course, you know that's kind of been a holy grail of uh, keeping batteries all recharged or replenished. You know, Ample is an interesting company. They are currently working with sort of commercial or leased fleets, but they're all light duty possibly because of the slight ease of uh, integration as opposed to heavier duty vehicles. And uh, they've had some smart approaches. Number one, they have a pre-built station that can be just dropped on a site and apparently installed and hooked up in three days. Uh, You don't need any trenching, which eliminates a lot of like long permitting uh, and construction timelines, etc. I think However, you know, this this subject has been one that's pretty fraught with uh, debate. For those who have been in this space for a while, you all may remember a company called Better Place received, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of funding, I believe, uh, and was a giant bust. <laughs> they all were only able to work with one car brand. Uh, one thing that Apple is doing differently is they're basically creating their own adapter plates and modules and being able to integrate with with in collaboration with OEMs, but not necessarily requiring the OEMs to retool their manufacturing lines. So basically, they're proposing to work with a large number of car companies, all of whom presumably have substantial, you know, proprietary IP tied up in their battery systems. And so this idea that it's all swappable just would seem to be a, a lot of work, and and maybe you know, legally challenging as well, perhaps. No, I think you're spot on, James. There's a lot of thorny hornet's nests that you have to deal with with battery swapping. I think there are a couple of key barriers, especially when you talk about working with OEMs for passenger cars. Number one, when you do battery swapping, you need a ton of extra components. 
uh, for packaging, for modularity, for safety, that re actually reduce the pack level energy density. And that is something that has gotten a lot more attention from OEMs because ultimately what matters is not cell level density, but the pack level density that the car uses. Oh. Uh, the, you know, second of all, you have potential reliability concerns because you have increased mating cycles. How do you make sure that dirt, dirt and water and other debris doesn't get in there? And then the last piece is, I think, what you were alluding to, which is OEMs are all sort of trying to use the best chemistries, and they're always trying to improve their range. So not only does that extra packaging around the modular battery pack reduce that, but they're essentially saying, hey, I'm going to let a third party disintermediate myself and not have control over my my range. Mm -hmm. Not only is that maybe a questionable decision from a business perspective, what does that do your, to your brand? If some of your vehicles might have great range and then other ones don't, and people don't realize it's because, oh, it's this battery pack system, which isn't really tied to the OEM. I actually think that battery swapping makes a lot more sense on heavy duty trucks. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because trucks like these truck manufacturers are not developing their own chemistries. Mm. And the way trucks are built are oftentimes they take off the shelf technology and cobble it together. So they're more willing to go and say, hey, if there's a solution that allows my customer to swap things really quickly and get back on the road, time is very much money to them. You know, passenger vehicles, most of the time they're at home, you know, like you just charge them up at home. It's not that hard. They are currently targeting kind of like Uber drivers uh, that are renting electric vehicles from a certain company. I think it's called Sally. You know, maybe there's something there, but I just don't see the value as much as for a for a very commercial use case where you have to keep that car or truck on the road as much as possible. As a technologist, I remain a fan of battery swapping. It overcomes a lot of the problems, but the commercial challenges are exactly as you described them, and I can't be cavalier about that. So I wish these people well. I think it's a tough road to hoe. So an interesting story uh, following permitting reform. Last week, the White House laid out its priorities for permitting reform, which was a pretty good list. And they've begun to lean now on the Department of Energy, which has new authorities and some new money through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the IRA to fast track permitting and to aggregate demand and so forth. As we all know, the stakes are enormous around this. We need to be able to build a lot of transmission and build it quickly. This story gets into how the Department of Energy might actually move these things forward so that we don't take 10 years or 15 years to permit, but it can be more like five to seven years. And what are some of those key levers that can be pulled to accelerate this process? Like what what really is bogging it down, I guess? We've we've heard so much about these long queues, et cetera. So what, what, what can be done to fix it? One of the things is proposed, and again, the DOE has put this forward and it's in part of the president's plan, uh, is around... Uh, pre-approved corridors on federal land. A lot of these transmission lines will go through federal land, and so if you have corridors that have been assessed where the analysis suggests that you can do so quickly with minimal damage and large positive outcomes, then those are places where you can sort of get that approval process done quickly. Another question around this, it's outside the DOE, is how much of this can FERC aggregate. Part of the permitting reform request that the president's put forward is actually for Congress to grant them those additional authorities. Um, and of course, like everything else, Ohm's law of finance, money overcomes resistance, just like voltage. <laughs> There's an opportunity here by just putting more money on the table through a combination of the incentives, grants, uh, these sorts of things that, to help fast track these things. The last thing, and this is again part of the president's plan, the DOB can absolutely do this, community engagement. As one of the 10 priorities that they laid out, they have a, pri a priority for the Department of Energy and other agencies to not only identify a head for community engagement, but to spend a fraction of their budget engaging communities so that you can get more positive traction on the ground. Just to make another connection is like, and it's it's connected but not fully connected, which is, you know, the, the effort in Montana to adjust how th these kind of reviews happen on the state level, right, which is to take out the consideration of what a project does for climate. That has been a debate on the federal level and that has recently been changed by Biden under guidance. That has also been a real debate. Like, do we do we assess the, the, the future climate impacts of a project as well? That has, you know, up until recently not been part of a regular NEPA analysis, which, which leads to an environmental impact statement or an environmental assessment, depending on the scale of the project. Yeah, there's a quote in this Canary Media article about this is from 
the NRDC. We're going to need to build a lot of transmission, but we have a bad history of systemic environmental racism in terms of how the infrastructure has been cited. So we've got to build this out while considering the communities. How do you, I mean, no one wants this in their backyard. No one, right? Like, it, I'm skeptical of community engagement being some kind of answer to this. And this is kind of one of my, my my typical quips, but there's a conversation happening within the environmental community that we got to get from NIMBY, not in my backyard, to YIMBY, which is yes, in my backyard, right? As someone who's worked in frontline communities along the Gulf Coast um, in Louisiana and in Texas, where that infrastructure primarily fossil fuel uh, plants, refineries, and petrochemical plants has happened, they historically didn't really have a say, right? So I, I think what the the effort is, is to have them ha- have a say from the early get-go of, of how this goes down. The second thing is what we often see is that the people developing these projects bypass community benefits. So they're like, we're going to put the transmission line through, but you're not going to get any royalties. You're not going to get any revenues. You're not going to get any jobs. Maybe a small number of landowners will get something, but the community won't. Often that's the point of objection. Mm -hmm. So it's being smart about community benefit plans and designing those properly early and starting to think early about all of that. The other thing I'll I'll say along those lines, until you talk to communities, you don't actually know what their concern is. Mm Mm-hmm. For a lot of communities, they could they could be like, well, we don't actually care about the transmission line very much, but we would like some electric buses because we care about asthma. Maybe there's something we could be done in here. In that context, part of the DOE work plan and part of the president's proposal involves really giving communities the resource to assess what they want. Maybe they need some expertise. Maybe they need technical questions answered. Maybe they need legal understanding. And all of these things are things that government agencies can bring into the mix. So by having a proactive and broad sense of community engagement, you can potentially defang a lot of concerns. So there's a new story uh, from the United Kingdom, our brethren across the pond, and they are counting on 10% of their total abatement as a nation to come from carbon capture and storage. So the UK has made impressive strides to decarbonize their power sector, that's gotten them a certain fraction of their total abatement. They have to go the rest of the way. So they have to get zero in transportation, zero in industry, zero in heating, all of these things. And as part of their economy, 90% of it can be done with other things like electric vehicles and offshore wind and nuclear. Uh, 10% is going to be faster, cheaper, and easier to do it with carbon capture. They've made a big step forward just this week, by permitting about 20 projects, giving them licenses to actually do the geological storage of CO2 under the North Sea. Mostly this is being targeted at things like existing steel mills and chemical plants. It would, in fact, allow for more hydrogen production with blue hydrogen. It would probably be for carbon capture on new power plants as well. But the idea is you need the permits. How do you get the stuff going? You have to build the infrastructure. You have to get to yes. This is an important step the UK has taken. I think that carbon capture sequestration is going to be a huge topic this year, especially going into COP in in UAE. You know, and we have to kind of come to grips with using it right at this point to relate to our first headline, which is about the probability of exceeding 1.5 C. There are certain industries like cement where CCS is really the only viable option right now. And, you know, one of the things that we're talking about at RMI is, is you know, using this technology in really targeted ways because because there's already brouhaha over COP. Uh, earlier this week, um, Christiana Figueres called out uh, the discussion already about CCS that's that's going to happen there as an excuse for the oil majors and fossil fuel companies to pollute more and do business as usual. Um, so it, it really has to be balanced with where do, do we really, really need it? Because no other, no other, no other options ag- exist, and that's what I think the UK example does. Right? It's only ten percent of their carbon reduction plan. The other ninety percent is going to be actual mitigation, which is mm-hmm. curbing emissions before um, before they hit the atmosphere or are captured to be sequestered. Well, 
let's be clear, Mm -hmm. carbon capture is actual mitigation. It is a radical departure from business as usual. Mm -hmm. I, I disagree with many in the environmental community who consider CCS to be an extension of the same business model, I consider it to be a very radical departure from the same business model. Because literally it's saying you can no longer pollute for free, you must take stewardship of your own emissions. And that's a pretty big shift. Um, Sultan Abu Jaber, the head mm-hmm. of COP28, has made a call for nations to zero out their fossil fuel emissions, not their fossil fuels which is exactly where Christina de Figueras uh, mm-hmm. was coming back with a counter gambit. Um, that is going to be the back and forth at COP28 is the role for this technology. Where does it make sense and how big should it be? And honestly, reasonable people can disagree on that. Interesting. We're, we're teeing up what should be a really, really great conversation on CCS and on, and trying to un, you know take apart some of those questions and issues with some some strong experts on both sides of that argument, similar to our nuclear episode that is in production coming soon. We're really excited about it. <laughs> so Great timing. It's a hot topic right now. Yes. And uh, similarly, because this is part of the EPA's new power plant rule for new and existing fossil fuel plants, we will be having a whole lot of that discussion this year in the U.S. too. Now for our interviews. Kingsmill Bond of RMI says the fossil fuel economy's best days are behind it. Kingsmill spent decades as a stock market analyst in markets in Europe, Asia, and South America. And though he was initially skeptical of the wind and solar energy industries, he became increasingly interested in their market potential. Eventually, he joined clean energy think tank RMI as a senior principal energy strategist. Kingsmill's recent co-authored report, which is titled Peak Fossil Fuel Demand for Electricity, posits that fossil fuel demand for electricity generation has peaked for 95% of the OECD, which stands for Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and for 31% of non-OECD countries. The report highlights the fact that in most of the world, utility-scale clean electricity generation through wind and solar is the cheapest source of electricity now suggesting that its growth will continue due to market demand. Meanwhile, global investments into fossil fuel infrastructure have significantly decreased, to the point where today, more than 80% of investments in new electricity generation goes to renewables, and less than 20% goes into power generation from fossil fuels, resulting in more than 90% of new electricity generation coming from solar or wind. I asked Kingsmill what peak fossil demand for electricity generation means exactly for the future of fossil fuels and global carbon emissions. Kingsmill, welcome to Climate Now. It's great to have you on our podcast today. Thanks for having me, James. So Kingsmill, you recently co-authored a report which was entitled Peak Fossil Fuel Demand for Electricity. So I'm wondering if you could explain what exactly peak fossil fuel demand for electricity is. Let's start there and then perhaps the findings of your report. In any transition, the peak of the old is an important signal of change. That's why we're focusing on it. And after the peak, three things happen. First of all, all of the growth is in the new technology, kind of by definition. Secondly, the old technology bounces along a plateau for a while, but then enters into decline. And that decline becomes kind of quite quick eventually. And then thirdly, because of these two things, you get feedback loops. So feedback loops mean that basically take the car sector, car companies now see the future as electric vehicles. So they stop investing in their ICE platforms. They they put all of their money into EV platforms and, and therefore that speeds up change. So once you get to the peak, you have these really important feedback loops. It particularly applies to financial markets you know, my own area of speciality because, and, and George Soros even has a word for this, reflexivity. You know, financial markets are paid to look to the future. And as they see one future which is different, then they, they invest accordingly in their investment in and of itself drives change. And so therefore, when we're looking at the electricity sector now at a global level, we would suggest that we've seen a peak in fossil fuel demand in the electricity system. And by the middle of this decade, by about 2025, the the demand for fossil fuels and electricity will start to decline actually quite quickly by about 4% a year by the second half of this decade. And what that means is that there's simply not enough space left for fossil fuel demand in electricity to grow because this other stuff is growing so quickly. So people often say to me, you know, there are individual countries and areas and territories where there's growth 
which is cartooning. Of course, that's the case. But as with anything else in life, you know, you have areas of growth and areas of decline. And, you know, our job as strategists and system thinkers is to to net up the two and see what's going on on the systems level. And it's absolutely clear that the systems level, we, we've reached this, this, this peak in demand for fossil fuels in the electricity system. I point your listeners to some great work done by NREL in the US, um, which I'm sure many people have listened to. And their basic point is that solar and wind are part of an electricity system. And as part of an electricity system with many other technologies, you can certainly take them up to 70 or 80 percent of the system without incurring excess costs. And 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 the point then I make as a strategist, I'm like, look, folks, 12 percent today of the system is now solar and wind. So mm-hmm. the kind of ceiling of opportunity is far above our heads. When you say we could take solar and wind up to about 70 to 80 percent of our energy production system, what do you mean by that? Well, in fact, I was thinking specifically 70 to 80 percent of electricity generation. There's a separate debate how far electricity itself can supply all of our energy. And it's also quite clear for what it's worth that electricity will grow over time. But within the electricity system, 70 to 80 percent is extremely feasible. You already have countries and regions such as Denmark and northern Germany and Australia and Ireland already planning for that level. And the way they do it, again, I kind of defer to people more expert than than I, but the way they do it, basically, it's a kind of combination of demand side response, supply side response, large amounts of capacity, some batteries, some storage in through hydro and and other solutions, and and better forecasting and, and limited use of fossil fuels for the moments where it's most difficult. That, incidentally, for me as a strategist, is is not a problem at all. Five percent of the system, whatever the number might be, to be fossil fuels in in the thinking of twenty twenty three. Because again, we're so far away from these barriers. We have a system that's so heavily dependent today upon fossil fuels that what really matters is is not the the boring debate about the end game in twenty fifty, but what's happening right now. Mm. Now, some people say about the this expand this huge expansion of renewables that. You know, where are we going to put it all? The land use constraints, for example, is how are countries like Ireland and places that might be a bit more land constrained dealing with this? If I may, to go on a little bit of a limb, first of all, we have today 100 times as much land available for the deployment of solar and wind technology as we need for all of our energy. 100 times. So, you know, do the math. Therefore, 1% of our entire land mass is all that you would need for all of humanity's desire for all energy sources today. And, you know, that data is very easy to calculate. You can do it with, with data from um, Solargis and, and, and Enrel. I've done it myself. So, we, you know, we, we can establish that you need less than 1% of your total land mass to generate all of our energy. And, and then you start looking around the world. Well, Mark Jackson has calculated that in the US, for example, the fossil fuel sector is using more than 1% of the United States landmass for its energy. So actually, these two numbers are roughly comparable because you need space for your mines, you need space for your pipelines, you need space for your exclusion zones, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So so the numbers are actually quite comparable. But of course, the difference is you you can graze sheep under solar panels you can have farms next to wind turbines. It's it's really not a genuine constraint. And then the, the other point is, you can do this calculation, of course, and we have done for every country in the world. And what becomes apparent is that it is true to say that there are 10 or 15 countries which genuinely are quite land constrained. So if the global number is 100, most of the global south, it's a thousand times as much renewable energy potential compared to their total energy demand today. Mm-hmm. The whole of Africa, for example, most of Africa is over a thousand times as, as much as this resource, 181 times for what it's worth if they use the same amount of energy as we, we do in the UK right now. But there are there are this small group of countries, so Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, 
Singapore, Korea and Japan, they have a problem because it's less than 10. That's about 10 to 14 percent of global energy demand. And these are countries which have to think creatively. But listen to the list of countries. You know, these are countries which have got fabulous, innovative technology sectors and they're finding solutions. So, you know, they're, they're, putting, they're, they're putting solar panels on all of their roofs. They're putting solar panels on their reservoirs. They, they're thinking of creative ways, in the case of Singapore, to import electricity through cables underwater. I mean, so there are solutions even for that group of countries. This human ingenuity and discovery of this enormous cheap energy resource is that we will exploit it one way or another, yeah. come what may. And I think this is a gen general point about the barriers to change that people raise. You know, the question we rate, we always ask people at RMI is about the barriers to change is, are they universal or, or specific? Are they immediate or some potential moment in, in the future? And are they insoluble mm. Or do we have the glimmerings of a solution? And when, when you ask those three questions, it becomes very quickly apparent that actually there are solutions. People are deploying this, this stuff. And a lot of the arguments about why change can't happen are very theoretical. And they're set, you know, some far distant date in the future. And they're just not, they're not real. In the last decade, we've solved the technology problems. We've solved the economic problems. Now, the only thing we have left is policy issues. It's much easier, or at least it should be much easier, for politicians and policymakers to solve those policy issues. Kingsmill Bond's research makes a compelling case that the demand for fossil fuels will continue to drop. Wind and solar alone could account for 70 to 80 percent of the global power mix. But what will it take to get there? In looking for the answer, we came across a presentation by analyst Nat Bullard, who has spent 15 years at the organization that would become Bloomberg's sustainable energy research arm, Bloomberg NEF. Nat has recently become an independent consultant and speaker, though he still regularly writes for Bloomberg Green. In January, Nat published a presentation called Decarbonization, the Long View Trends and Transients Net Zero. It's a kind of state of the union address for decarbonization, combining the latest technology, politics, economics, and other factors for a truly comprehensive take. I highly recommend checking it out at nathanielbullard.com slash presentations. Nat was gracious enough to give us a summary of his findings. He said it's clear that the global energy economy is changing and fast. That's inevitable. The question is, how should we respond to that change? How do we conceive of a change that in one sense feels like it is an evolution. So after we've gone from doing sort of bespoke little renewable energy projects to sort of a more involved and more evolved energy transition in big companies to then getting everybody to no emissions by the middle of the century, it feels like it's the next step, but it is so much more than that. Yes, we've more or less peaked our inputs of fossil fuels into this system. And all of the growth is coming from things that are, that are zero carbon. That's coming for the most part from renewable power, but it's also coming in the United States from biofuels as well. But that's, it, it's important, right? It means you're at a long plateau potentially that then really it's up to technology and policy to inflect and force downwards. But you're also at the point where like all of the growth is coming from these areas. And what about globally? Is that fact consistent around the world that it, growth in energy, primary energy demand is, is being met through through renewables? Not quite. So it's not quite there. We've got big, bigger systems in the US that are still very much growing their top line of primary energy. On the electricity side, though, it's, it's getting closer and closer to the point where all incremental demand is being met by renewables. We're at the point where, you know, a, approaching 80% of the growth in electricity demand is being met by, by renewables. And then related to that is that in the transport sector, all of the, the growth in the sale of automobiles is electric. At this point, I asked Nat to share his own projections on what's next for the energy sector. But there's a big caveat here. Economic forecasts are notoriously bad at actually deciphering the future. Nat's aforementioned presentation has a whole section up front about how decades-old forecasts about American power consumption turned out to be completely off the mark. Nevertheless, Nat says economic models are still very useful for understanding present-day markets and preparing for contingencies, even if the future itself remains a mystery. 
Thus, it was worth hazarding a few educated guesses about where the global energy industry could be headed. You can could have come up with all kinds of rationales, all kinds of mechanisms for thinking about why these markets might not grow mm. in the future. Mm. But what has proven most durable is to simply fit a logistic curve to the pattern that's already happening, you know, and, and to say, look, these are the sort of the smoothest deployment curves of a, of a technology in terms of its delivered energy ever, like, you know, nuclear power rises and then stops, right? Gas and coal bump into each other over time. Hydro has a, a it's a level and moves very slowly. But these two things move on a logistic curve that looks, you know, it looks like this. We're in the steep part of it, turning into an S curve. So the two things being solar and wind. Solar and wind. Uh-huh. Solar and wind. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> we're looking at electric vehicles being similar in terms of their share of sales. We're looking at EV electric electricity storage, usually in the form of like lithium ion storage batteries, also following a similar curve. Why is that? You know, why why do some of these technologies like solar and wind? You know, where, you you know, they, and people will say, oh, it's because they were subsidized or it's because of this or that. And, but other things are subsidized too. Like why, why has that happened? The the main, the main reason is that they improve in efficiency over time. They decrease in cost as a function of how much they're manufactured. And this becomes a virtuous cycle. They get cheaper because they're getting better and we do more of them, Mm -hmm. which makes them cheaper, which makes us do more of it, which makes them better. And and they're also at a price point in terms of the delivered energy from them that certainly on the margin is the, usually the cheapest electricity anywhere. So that's that's part of it. There's also a great deal of competition between the providers of, of these technologies. There are many providers. They're competing intensely with each other. And there's a lot of process innovation, if I will. Like there's, you know, we're not actually in, in a good way dependent upon some sort of fundamental breakthrough. You know, mm-hmm. we don't need the cold fusion equivalent. We simply need to grind the gears ever more fine on making things by the hundreds of millions in the case of solar panels and batteries, or billions perhaps every year. And so those, those characteristics are, are important to note, you know, and related to that is that there was a, a study that I, I cited from, from Oxford Institute for New Economic Thinking that there are also things that do not improve over time. You know, one, one of the charts he was talking about, and I think that surprised me in my findings is, and look that the, the useful cost of energy from coal, so expressed in megawatt hour terms, has pretty much not moved in 125 years. The useful cost. So what does that mean exactly? So that means that like when you get to the point of delivering that energy, not just the cost of coal, the, th- you know, the, the, the input, mm-hmm. but the electricity that comes out of it, you know, something that people are then going to use. It basically, ha- it basically hasn't moved. You cannot change the nature of coal. Right. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't like the energy, the energy value within it can be extracted more efficiently, but it itself is not changing. And all of the technologies that do transform it into something are impacted by commodity prices over time and by trade flows and things like that. And the result is that like they haven't improved. Right. Now, one question I've had about the decarbonization of the power market has to do with distribution. To what degree will power generation happen in a distributed fashion where you have solar panels on homes and industrial parks powered by microgrids and, you know, every mall, every sort of commercial building has solar versus large scale deployments, utility scale deployments that require significant transmission infrastructure. What do some of the numbers and trend lines tell us about where that's likely to end up in your view? To my mind, it's really a big question about transmission more than anything as the determinant of what gets built and where. Mm. And I say that because almost in every instance, the utility scale power generation from renewable assets is going to be cheaper than anything that is smaller and built into the distribution grid. Mm-hmm. And if your cost to interconnect it is sufficiently low, then that makes the most sense. Mm-hmm. But if those don't, you know, if, if that, that other element, if transmission does not happen, then I think things will find their way forced further into the distribution grid, competing with the economics of the power that gets delivered to end users rather than the power that gets generated and put into the grid by large power generation assets. I feel like that's not a very satisfying answer because it's actually not a very satisfying outcome either in the sense that like this is an inflection that is dependent upon things that are not within the realm of some kind of disruptive innovation. Hmm. 
they're not within the realm of inventing one's way out of the problem. It's really a question of, is there willpower and broadly conceived capability to do things in the policy planning permission capital markets realms to accelerate what's there? What do you think will happen? Do you, what, do you think that we'll figure that out? I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that we will that we will figure it out because I think it's in, it's been given a sense that it's it's an imperative that aligns nicely to an extent across the political spectrum, which is we need we need planning and permission for energy assets, and you know if you have to make a sort of a grand bargain to do that, you have you know you'll you'll receive a pipeline here and there in exchange for building you know, hundreds of gigawatts worth of new transmission capacity. Because as you said, as you just described, you know, we've got a huge amount of generation that if we if we can clean up these permitting, you know, permitting rules is going to come online. It's it's going to be renewables that get built, not a huge amount of not, not gas. And that, that's right. I de- delivered a slide for a, a visiting business delegation about a month ago. And you know, the covers that I, I put up two magazine covers that were published at almost the same time. And one is the cover of The Economist, sort of, you know, archetypal kind of center right, small C conservative, intellectual conservative magazine mm-hmm. that has somebody hugging a transmission pylon. And then the other one is Mother Jones magazine, which has somebody hugging a bucket, the bucket and, and loader and lift of an, of an excavator. Like, <laughs> and they're basically both saying the same things. Like time to get things built, like learn to love infrastructure. There's not actually a way to transform our current system. If you believe that that needs to be done by not doing things like it will, it, it will slowly kind of grind fine over time and change elements of itself. But if you want to be transformational, that requires doing quite a bit. So the Inflation Reduction Act, some call it the biggest, you know, climate bill of all time. Some I've heard I've heard one talk on on how it's really just a domestic sort of production subsidy or stimulus bill. What impacts do you find to be the most interesting coming out of the early innings of the deployment of this bill? I think that we we're just beginning to understand exactly what's in the IRA. You know, some of the incentives within it are uncapped. Others of them last for a decade at a time. Mm -hmm. And so the market, essentially the market has been given a lattice work and or or a a skeletal structure in the form of policy. It reminds, it reminds me of a very funny scientific meme, which is if you were to give, you know, an, an illustrator a skull of a hippopotamus, what kind of what kind of horrendous monster would you actually generate from mm. looking at this this large skull with protruding teeth? You'd have some horrendously dangerous looking carnivore. But no, you get a hippo, right? Like we don't we don't actually know we don't know the soft tissue that that's going to be fully built upon this. And as an element of that, we we don't really we don't know yet which things what industries I think are going to be created by it. My my inkling is that like the incentives around hydrogen in particular are going to essentially will some industries into being by virtue of the largesse of the policies that might not have otherwise happened. What we need to watch is like, where are announcements being made specifically because of that? Mm -hmm. What parts of the country, what kinds of capacities are being built? What things are being brought to the US that left? What things are being built for the first time here? Mm -hmm. You know, and how is it, you know, how is it creating new industries? Mm -hmm. Where are there models that are being built specifically on the back Mm -hmm. of the new affordances and allowances that come from the IRA. Well, Ned, I just want to thank you so much for for joining us. This was really a great conversation. I appreciate you uh, spending time with us today. Thanks, James. My pleasure. That was Nat Bullard, an independent consultant, columnist for Bloomberg Green, senior contributor to Bloomberg NEF, and venture partner at Voyager Ventures. And earlier in the episode, you heard from Kings Mill Bond, Principal Energy Strategist at the Clean Energy Think Tank, RMI. That's it for this episode of the Climate Now podcast. To learn more about the potential future of the energy sector, check out our other podcast conversations at climatenow.com. And if you'd like to get in touch, email us at contact at climatenow.com or tweet us at We Are Climate Now. We hope you'll join us for our next conversation.
Climate Now is made possible in part by our science partners like the Livermore Lab Foundation. The Livermore Lab Foundation supports climate research and carbon cleanup initiatives at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, which is a Department of Energy Applied Science and Research facility. More information on the Foundation's climate work can be found at livermorelabfoundation.org.